Okay, welcome back to our discussions on the different types of emergencies. Last time, we were able to discuss uh, different calamities, cardiopulmonary problems, hemorrhages, accidents, musculoskeletal injuries, and poisoning. This time, we are to cover the following topics, bites and stings, environmental emergencies, and of course, rape as a type of emergency. Let's first discuss bites and stings. So animals and human bites can be comparable. Okay, um, They might post you of having uh, infection. Specifically, we are pertaining to rabies infection. So to prevent this kind of infection, uh, we may perform thorough cleaning with soap and copious amount of clean water. We can also administer tetanus prophylaxis to prevent uh, the infection from Clostridium tetany. All right, for the bites and stings, let's talk about first uh, rabies infection, okay? Uh, when we, we think about the rabies infection, we usually think first of dogs or dog bites. Okay? But it is not only dogs can impose the risk of us having rabies infections. There could be some other mammals, even humans. All right, human bites who were infected by rabies. Okay, so other than dogs, humans, they can also be uh, cats, uh, horses, for example, or uh, an animal from the wild which is bat, you know, can also uh, have rabies infection and may infect humans. So rabies infection is an acute infection caused by a viral illness. It's a zoonotic disease, no, since it is coming from an animal, okay, that affects the musculoskeletal system as well as the brain. So the virus is transmitted through bites and is considered to be fatal. Uh, the fastest would be within 24 hours, one can die of rabies infection. So how do we prevent this kind of uh, zoonotic disease? So there should be a compulsory vaccinations of our pets, be it cat, dog, no, of them to, to, to prevent, of course, rabies infections as they roam around uh, within our community or with, even within our household. So if in case in, within the community, we have to capture stray animals. So pre-exposure prophylaxis, of course, of humans, individuals should also be given, especially to those of healthcare workers who may be exposed or highly exposed to this kind of infection, such as those in the emergency room. So when do we have to have prophylaxis. Prophylaxis could be a pre-exposure prophylaxis, meaning you haven't had any bites from any sources of rabies infection like dog or cat. And the other one would be post-exposure prophylaxis, wherein you already sustained a bite from an infected animal, then therefore preventing infection by getting vaccination or getting vaccinated. So, when we sustained a bite from a wild animal, we should get shots for rabies. There would be, if in case, unprovoked attack of any dogs, be it a stray dog or a dog in the household. So, bites from animals with signs of rabies. So, there could be an observation period of within 14 days or 2 weeks. If the animal will die within that period, they may be um, infected by rabies. Okay? But we don't want to wait uh, after 2 weeks or 14 days for you to get vaccinated. So from the time of bite of this animal, you should immediately seek a consultation and of course get vaccinated. So what do we do now if we do sustain a bite from an animal, be it a stray or a household pet? So first, you have to wash it with running water 
and soap. So we have to use running water so that we do not actually, uh, for example, if we do submerge our uh, wounds in a pail or a bucket of water, then wash it in there. If in case that it is truly infected, the virus will just continually be present at the bucket of water. Unlike when we do a run, use a running water like in the, coming from the faucet, so you will be eliminating uh, the present microorganisms in there. Of course, soap will help in decontamination or disinfection of this. Next would be, of course, we have to apply antiseptic solutions. Okay, so um, antiseptic solutions such as povidone iodine. Okay. So this may help uh, decreasing or eliminating the infection present. If in case, we do not want to use topical uh, antibiotic ointments since ointments may cover up the wound, therefore um, not allowing the penetration of air or oxygen inside the wound, especially if it is a deep kind of wound, okay? Because as we know, the presence of wound may do impose the patient of having uh, Clostridium tetani infection or tetanus infection. So we don't want that. So therefore, we don't want to use uh, ointment which prevents oxygen from coming in the or going inside the wound. So we would like to avoid other treatments such as those of um, traditional use of traditional uh, treatments such as the use of tandok. Tandok is uh, the use of actual horn coming from a uh, carabao, for example. You know horn that it is hollow and what they'll do is that they put the other end of the horn, the bigger lumen of the horn to the wound and on the other side or on the other end, they will suck up the blood. Okay, So it will act as a suction so that the blood may come out okay garlic so there are some uh, areas in the country that they do use uh, garlic they just put garlic over the wound and they will just think that the garlic will absorb the infection others may involve like uh, a coin they use coin they put coin over the wound or the bite, no, and they say that when the coin already the coin falls off, the infection also also uh, comes with the coin, okay, and many others. Uh, these activities are not proven to be effective in fighting rabies infection, and it may pose a big risk for the individual to die immediately just because they are not managed well properly at the health facilities. So next, of course, is to bring to the hospital or any animal bite centers or animal bite treatment centers near the household or wherever the patient is for them to get a post-exposure prophylaxis. You might be asking, sir, do we have to bleed the wound or the bite? Okay, so we don't want to bleed the wound or bite because uh, it may allow the virus to travel more fast or faster going to the central nervous system. Okay, so what we would like to do is just to um, wash the wound thoroughly and not uh, pressing or putting pressure on it and bleeding it. Bleeding it. All right. This time we are to talk about bee stings. All right. You can see usually in the movies, right? Especially in cartoons, that bees are actually chasing humans. No, but does it really happen in actual scenarios? Um, the answer would be yes. Okay, especially if you hit a hive, no, a beehive, since this bees usually releases um, some enzymes, pheromones 
no? That when they do sting one individual, others may be called through this uh, sense of uh, communication by the bees. So bee sting is basically means a sting coming from a bee. So it is also known as hymeno I mean of terra stings. So people who are allergic to bee stings may trigger a dangerous anaphylactic reaction that is potentially, of course, deadly. Honey bee sting release pheromones that prompt uh, nearby bees to attack the so what do we do now if someone is stung by a bee? So the first step in treating the bee sting is, of course, to remove the sting itself. Um, if you can remove it using your fingers uh, or with the use of the nails, it's good. However, it may be very difficult since the, uh, the sting is actually deep inside the skin. So... You may actually use a card, the credit card, maybe an ID to help you remove the sting. Application of eyes to the sting site may provide some mild relief or comfort. So we may apply it. If in case an individual is having an allergic reaction, he or she may receive an antihistamine. So bring immediately to the nearby hospital for uh, administration of antihistamine as prophylaxis and of course for pain management. Next one would be a jellyfish sting. Jellyfish are free-swimming non-aggressive gelatinous marine animals surrounded by tentacles. So these tentacles are usually covered with sacs known to be as your nematocysts. So those are filled with poisons that can cause painful to sometimes life-threatening state. So what are what would be the signs and symptoms of a jellyfish sting? So there would be an intense stinging pain, itching, rashes, and swelling could be present over the skin that may lead also to the formation of cellulitis. So if the person has been stung in the mouth or placed uh, tentacles in their mouth and are expected to develop voice changes, this may be caused by the allergic reaction. Others would be a presence of difficulty of swallowing or a swelling of the tongue and or of the lips. So there may be progressive effects of jellyfish sting, which may include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, including lymph node swelling, abdominal pain, numbness or tingling, and of course, muscle spasms. There could be also severe reactions to the venom that is released by the tentacles of the jellyfish. So severe reactions may lead to difficulty of breathing and at times even to leading to death within just a matter of few minutes. So what do we do if in case you or someone with you is stung by a jellyfish with their tentacles? There may be some uh, someone, or you have heard of it, that the urine may be helpful to manage the jellyfish sting. But is it really safe for us to use uh, urine? Of course, we know that urine is a body waste. However, it, it is sterile inside the body. But still, these are wastes coming from or eliminated by your body. So it is not actually a good management for the jelly for the jellyfish thing. So what do we have to do according to some researches like this one from the University of Arkansas that we may use salt water to deactivate the sting cells. Okay? So kung nandun ka very very parang odd right since you are already in the salt water uh, while swimming with the jellyfish then you got stung then later on you have to clean it with uh, 
salt water as well. So what you have to do is, of course, uh, move, remove the sting if in case, you know, if it is still present, or remove the tentacles or the jellyfish if it is still there, uh, or a copious amount of salt water that is also coming from the salt water from the beach for example so this will deactivate the sting and of course uh, never use um, up water or your fresh water because it may actually um, not help in relieving the jellyfish sting it is also helpful to try to remove the cells carefully with something such as a card again just like what you do in the bee sting. So bring immediately to the hospital for the for the following to be given as ordered by the physician. So diphenhydramine or Benadryl, it may it can help the prevent allergic reaction coming from the jellyfish sting. Pain medication such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Topical steroids or steroid by oral route may help reduce the swelling and itchiness and prescribe cell antibiotics for cellulitis if in case present. Um, uh, by the way, other than using salt water, there, they, there are some uh, studies that have shown the effectiveness of the use of acetic acid or your vinegar in managing the sting no but of course as an immediate intervention you can use the salt water because you do not have actually uh, vinegar every time when you go to the beach next one would be your snake bites so snake bites or the snakes usually often bite their prey when feeding but occasionally they also bite humans by the way, uh, not all snakes are poisonous or has venoms, right? But usually, uh, those venomous are your rattlesnake, your cobra, just like what you can see in the image. So, snake bites manifestations. First, there would be a superficial parallel incision lengthwise through the fang marks. There could be local swelling, ecchymosis, uh, tissue necrosis, and pain. Nausea and vomiting could also be present. Visual difficulty, neurotoxic effect, and respiratory paralysis. So based from the World Health Organization's guidelines for clinical management of snake bites in Southeast Asia region, the following can be performed. So unless or dangerous tradition, popular or useless or dangerous traditions, popular, available, and affordable first aid methods that will just cause harm would be the following. Ibig sabihin, we don't have to do any of the following. Okay? So making local incisions or pricking punctures at the site of the bite or in the beaten limb. It will just promote uh, further infections if in case uh, because you will be introducing and opening the skin integrity of the patient. Attempting to suck the venom out of the wound. So if in case that it is actually uh, venomous, the snake is truly venomous, the one who will be sucking the, the blood will be also having the risk of having uh, venom in his body causing poisoning okay, or death. The use of uh, black snake stones tying tight bands, tourniquets around the limbs since this may uh, impede the blood flow uh, over the area. You know? We may apply tourniquet however not too tight so that uh, blood supply will still be present at the distal extremity, for example, the in case of presence of bite over the area. So electric shock, of course, it may cause um, 
cardiovascular problems to the patient and might lead to death if in case of over electrocution. Topical insulation or application of chemicals. No? So of course, chemicals that are not proven to be effective may not help in the management of snake bites. So what do we have to do as form of first aid is to reassure the victim who may be very anxious at that point. Why is it so? Since when the venom is introduced to the body, the increase in the heart rate caused by anxiety of the patient can hasten the distribution of the venom. Okay, so rapid heart rate can lead to rapid um, poisoning of the body. So immobilize the beaten limb with a splint or a sling. Any movement or muscular contraction increases the absorption of venom into the bloodstream and the lymphatics. So consider pressure immobilization for some elapid bites. When we do say elapid bites, uh, these are snake bites. No? Usually, your what you call in Tagalog is ulupong. Your ulupong is your uh, cobra, right? Then let's now go, so that's enough for the bites and stings. Now let's try to discuss different environmental emergencies. Some of the environmental emergencies that will be tackled here are not quite common in the country, in the Philippines. But we should still be familiar with it and know what to do if in case this happens to, to our patients. Okay, so first let's talk about heat illness. So heat illness, of course, we know that it is related to the weather, to the humidity of the area. So there could be some and other problems alongside with this heat illness. First would be heat syncope. So it is an orthostatic dizziness or syncope when no other cause is apparent. Of course, you know what syncope is. It is the transient loss of consciousness. So there could be no other cause. Patient is not having a cardiovascular disease or any other problem. But there is a presence of high humidity or high temperature of the environment. It is more common in persons with heart disease and in patients who, who are on diuretic because they may become dehydrated even more. Second would be heat edema. There would be a slight dependent edema present common in an acclimatized person. Those who are who haven't actually um, adjusted to the environment he is in. And third would be your heat tetany. So individuals exposed to heat Heated air may hyperventilate enough to develop an acute respiratory alkalosis. So, you may see sir, circumoral paresthesias among these kinds of patients. Another would be heat cramps. It is a mechanism. The mechanism of these heat cramps is actually unknown. However, uh, Hyponatremia may play a, a big role in the presence of heat cramps and usually uh, pinpointed as the usual cause of this. We know that uh, the sodium is considered to be your one of the electrolytes that has a big role in the relaxation of muscles. No? So... This or the loss of sodium may lead to over cramping or over shortening of the muscles. By the way, of course, hyponatremia happens because of excessive elimination of sodium. Maybe because of the uh, hot environment that leads patient to over sweating. Fifth would be heat exhaustion. So vasomotor collapse caused by inability of the body to supply peripheral vessels 
adequately with sufficient fluids to reduce the perspiration needed for cooling and may meet vital tissue requirements. So, follows an extended period of vigorous exercise in hot weather may be uh, one of the causes of this heat exhaustion. Another would be dehydration and, of course, hyponatremia or your salt depletion. Uh, one of the um, one of the fatal uh, problems with heat illness would be heat stroke. Okay, it is also called as your sunstroke. Uh, even if it is fatal, uh, it's kind of least common among the heat illnesses, and it is usually promptly recognized less likely to be recognized immediately, which may pose an increased risk of patient's death, okay? Because the individuals or the persons around the patient who had heat stroke or sunstroke is not usually aware that it is actually happening to the patient. So the urban, elderly, poor are the most common victims of heat stroke. It is characterized, take note, by the body temperature of 40.6 degrees centigrade. So it is high temperature that is actually occurring to your patient. Excessive body heat is retained caused by failure of perspiration regulating mechanism by the hypothalamus. So it is very odd since we expect that when we are in heat or the environment is hot, we do perspire most. No? But in this kind of heat stroke, these patients do not actually perspire. That's why that body temperature is continuously increasing up to 40.6 degrees centigrade or even more. Okay. So what could be the difference between a heat illness and heat stroke? Or so or heat exhaustion rather. So if the patient is having heat exhaustion, uh, he or she may still have a moist and clammy skin, meaning you can see that the patient is actually perspiring. Okay, it is a mechanism of the body to release ex excess heat, right? So pupils of the patient may be dilated and there could be normal or subnormal body temperature, meaning it can be elevated, but it is not too high. Meanwhile, a patient who is having heat stroke could have a very dry and hot skin. So it means that the body cannot actually release excess body temperature or excess heat, therefore leading to a very high temperature of 40.6 and above. So pupils of these patients having heat stroke are constricted. So what do we do if in case a uh, heat stroke happens to our patient? Of course, he may, uh, if he or she is uh, wearing a very tight gown or a tight clothing, try to loosen it up. Okay, applied cold compress to your patient, especially to the usually hot area to the armpits, to the groin, okay? Uh, use a fan to lower temperature or if in case present, aircon could be a very good choice. We try to elevate the feet of the patient to promote the circulation. And of course, have the person lie on his back. If the patient or in the, if the individual is awake, try to give uh, fluids. Uh, maybe a cold fluid would be better, but be cautious on it, no? Since patients may have uh, or may aspirate if he or she is kind of uh, lethargic when you do give fluids. We're done with heat illnesses. Now let's move to cold illness. So this does not usually happen in the Philippines. And one would be accidental hypothermia. It is a condition in which an organism, human of course, temperature drops below that required for normal metabolism and bodily functions. Another would be frostbite. It is a, a medical condition 
were in localized damages caused to skin and other tissue due to extreme cold. Okay, so for the ones you can see on the images here in uh, are actually frostbite. Okay, there are already damages over the skin. Hypothermia is just simply uh, a decrease in the temperature in the localized area of the body. However, frostbite, there could already be tissue damages because of extreme uh, low temperature. So what do we do in cases of cold illnesses? So of course, we have to keep the area, the body dry. Sheltering or going to an area that is actually warm may be a very good choice. And of course, gradual warming is necessary. So, rewarm through close body contacts from a companion and by drinking warm fluids. Uh, sweet liquids may also help since the body may uh, continuously work uh, by taking this uh, glucose-rich drinks. External techniques such as heated blankets for mild hypothermia and by more invasive techniques. Never massage affected area to rewarm as this cause maceration of tissues and can cause extreme pain. Okay, when we do say maceration, it is like that um, you are putting more of damage to the skin, causing it to, to have uh, wounds, for example, since the areas are already near necrosis. Handle area gently to prevent trauma to the injured part, especially these are, uh, especially the sensations of the area is already decreased because of the low temperature. And last of these emergencies are is rape. Okay, rape is considered to be an emergency and is defined by the Republic Act, eighty three fifty three. So it is committed by a man who shall have carnal knowledge, meaning uh, it is thought of, okay? there would be intention. So carnal knowledge of a woman under any of the following circumstances. Through force, a threat, or maybe intimidation, and committed by any person who shall commit an act of sexual assault, by inserting his penis into another person's mouth or anal orifice or any instrument or object into genital or anal orifice of another person. So a violent crime leading to physical, psychological trauma to the victim. So the following could be outcomes of rape. Of course, number one is sexually transmitted infection. Have we seen uh, someone who have worn or have heard at least someone who have worn condom when he or she or when he intended to rape someone? Okay, so STI could be common such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, hepatitis B. Um, one of could possibly worst outcome of rape is pregnancy. Especially, it may impose uh, a very high psychological problem to the one that is raped no? or to the woman. Physical injury, such as injuries to the genital area and other parts of the body. Post-traumatic stress disorder, disorder can manifest as depression, okay? substance abuse, or the individual may do self-harm because of the distress that he experienced from the from rape being raped so management is of course check the history uh, you as an emergency nurse should have a very good assessment um, techniques to have at least sense the or have the vibe of maybe uh, this patient or individual may be a victim of rape okay most of the patients will not tell you that he or she is a victim of rape, but there could be signs that you should be aware of. Okay. 
check the history uh, if in case when did it happen the place of assault so who put and what and where if contraception or condoms were used you may also ask a thorough general and genital examination would be performed to look for any injuries and to collect evidence for evaluation take note that this uh, rape incidences are medical legal cases okay these are not usual uh, case in the hospital that you should manage they have to seek for a legal consult as well several laboratory tests will be done for forensic purposes for a test for sexually transmitted infection and of course a pregnancy test Emotional support is necessary for the victims of rape, physical comfort, counseling, and of course, spiritual support.